don't know him, so for those of you who don't know him, Rich Blackett is currently the chair of uh, AUK or Asatru UK, which is must be the largest UK inclusive um, heathen organisation, I think. He's also Thanks. a member of the Pagan Federation in the UK uh, and on the Pagan and Heathen Symposium. He's uh, been involved in writing uh, books with other members of Asatru UK. Very nice, useful little books. I don't know if you were involved in the latest um, Yorkshire Havamal venture. I was not, but I'm <laughs> quite envious of that one. It is quite a good fun book. I, it, it looks to be, the snippets I've seen, it looks absolutely fantastic. Um, if anyone's interested in the Havamal in a Yorkshire dialect, um, definitely, you know, do look it up. Um, so without further ado, I will hand you over to Rich. Hello, and thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Although you've given away some of my slides already, but that's fine. <laughs> okay, so just start this up. And there we have our main heading. Wolves and wolf cults towards a new heathen practice. Now, if you've ever seen me speak before, you'll know I like to talk about wolves and werewolves and wolf cults. And this is not wholly a repeat of my previous talks. There'll be a, one or two things you might have heard before, but there's a whole new territory I'm getting into here. I'm going to be touching on UPG, which is a, not something I share very often, but I'm looking forward to that. And having heard the tail end of the conversation before, I feel much more relaxed about that as people were talking about things. So, again, this is very much new territory for me. Because normally it's all scrupulous research, facts, facts, facts. And yes, there is some of that, but we'll be slowly edging into very speculative areas. And hopefully at the end, as is heathen tradition, you'll tell me why I'm wrong. So a little bit of background about me, as you probably heard before there. I'm chair of Astro UK, and that's our big logo in the background there. For Americans who might be a little bit nervous about the word Asatru, because I know it has a sort of negative connotation over there, we are the largest inclusive group in the United Kingdom. And uh, our most recent ritual was very pointedly, as a sort of statement of purpose, was led by an openly queer woman and was tremendous. I'm also involved with the Pagan Federation on the communications side, head of the communications team there. And in conjunction with the committee there and other people in our huge push to sort of, I know it's a dirty word, but to get involved with branding and pushing our sort of approach, it's led to a colossal rise in membership and in outreach and things like that. I'm also involved slightly with the prison chaplaincy, the pagan prison chaplaincy, which does exist in the United Kingdom, which also spun out of the Pagan Federation. And I've helped to talk about things like extremism and make people aware of what is benign heathenry and what isn't. And as part of that work, I've then done some outreach with uh, the Metropolitan Police and Nottinghamshire Police and one or two other groups, again, to sort of explain the differences between different groups, should we say, without getting too much into the weeds. But the very fact that we're doing that means that they're aware of us, that they're aware that, that there is people who are positive. And that's really where the sort of work I've been doing, a lot of it is behind the scenes, and I try not to be too egocentric about that, I try to sort of hold myself back, because it's not, I don't want it to become a, a cult of personality or anything like that. So beginnings, this is the very first of uh, Heathen Women Conference I gave a talk at, and there's a little, not very flattering picture of me uh, gesticulating at various things there. I have the recording of that, I'm happy to share that with you. Fun little background story on that one was that my entire talk had been uh, completely corrupted. So I had to reconstruct my talk from scratch on my phone at about three in the morning the night before. But it went quite well, and uh, I, I always look forward to participating in these conferences. 
And yes, I do talk a lot about werewolves and things like that. And that actually spun out of a particular a presentation I did very last minute at a heathen festival where a particular speaker dropped out for completely unforeseen reasons. And it was the last talk of the whole weekend. So I volunteered to give a talk on werewolves and wolf cults because whatever you might want to say about the gods looking out for me, literally the week before I'd read a book on werewolves and wolf cults and how it fed into European culture. And I'd also, as part of my day job, I'd done a course on public speaking. So all the stars aligned, the gods were watching out for me, whatever we want to say. So I gave a talk on that. And that's led to many other talks. It led to the talk at the Heathen Women Conference and many other things besides. And as the course of talking about werewolves and what it really meant sort of deeper and deeper in time, I began to look into something which I kind of loosely called the wolf cult as to how that manifests in various cultures, even today, as we'll see later on. But this is very much what I'm getting into. This is just a very quick summary of the sort of things I've been talking about in the past. And again, the very controversial concept of the Menabunda, and which even some of those books on that are very hard to get hold of because they were so toxic and tainted by their usage by, who we say, certain groups during the, the mid 40s. And further back in time, I was looking to things such as the Bronze Age rites. Um, David Anthony and Dorcas Brown have written about that and various sort of evidence there that may show a sort of even deeper time relationship between humans and wolves in a ritual sense. <sighs> so we're looking at also berserkers and wolf -hesnar. Now, obviously, Roderick Dale has written extensively on that, but... Um, We'll be looking at, uh, I'm not going to get too much into that, but it is a very, very familiar thing with people, anybody who's even got a tangential interest or knowledge about Vikings or even heathenry has a certain preconception about what that means. A little screenshot behind there from the Northman. Uh, the issue, of course, is that this was being mythologized even at the time by the people doing it and harking back to an even older age and modern day preconceptions of berserkers and what they might have looked like if you look online, just type in Berserker, you'll see all kinds of fantastic illustrations of 10-foot Vikings with, you know, 16 packs of muscle and all, all that kind of thing. And as I said before, it's been appropriated, that kind of, as we talked about in the discussion before, it's been very much appropriate and blended into this very toxic co concept of what heathen culture is, what Viking culture was. So it's very important to sort of, from where I'm coming from, to kind of, go a different direction. And that's really what this talk is about. And it is deeply misunderstood, the berserkers and the Hedna and what people believe about it and where they think it's heading. And people want to be a berserker. And there's various groups of varying provenance who, who believe that they can become one. And modern heathenry, as we know, as we're all here participating in it, is quite a different animal from ancient heathenry, despite our best efforts, we can only reconstruct so far. There's a limit to what we can do. But it is a modern form of paganism. And essentially the main groupings we're seeing, I don't want to say universalist versus folkish or whatever, but really what we're looking at is in a broader term is inclusive versus exclusive. And it is significant that the inclusive groups have seen a huge growth because they're inclusive. Whereas exclusive groups tend to be rumbling along in their very small pocket of whatever they're doing. But this has led to a huge growth in heathenry, not just in England but, and Scotland and Wales and Ireland, but also around the world and places like South America and all kinds of interesting places, and which is fantastic. And that's the way it should be. And the more people who are coming into this religion or belief, uh, the stronger it's become, I believe. Beyond that, though, is a very interesting group of people who probably won't even call themselves heathens or even pagans. I like to call them the pagan adjacent community. People who are probably have never done a ritual, might not have even attended a moot or anything like that, but they like the aesthetics of it. They like the, the vibe of it. And they, again, have very, very strong, usually wrong ideas about what Viking culture is or what heathenry might be. And that's an even harder group of people to argue with. But it is a large community of people outside many of the people here 
and how they interact with us and how we reach out to them is it's a challenge but as i said it has been global growth across the world and helped yes admittedly in part by vikings tv series and films like the northman and other all the multiple straight to dvd or straight to streaming um, movies and, and tv series that have been made but it is happening and this conference and ones like it and events that i attended recently are very much a, an indication of that growth so let's get into the weeds and the dirt, dark and dirty stuff let's talk about modern wolf cults and as we mentioned in the discussion before there are many sort of small but very vocal and very active little groups who identify as wolf cults and this is a problem for heathen because some of them are heathen some of them aren't some of them identify that way so mostly it's a, a, the aesthetics and but they are for the most part very problematic they have this romanticized idea of the past often from usually victorian era sort of text or sometimes what you might call proto-nazi types sort of texts and concepts of the soul of the ancient north man and that sort of thing and this is very difficult to push against because it's such an alluring thing this idea it's it's very tempting this I, this mythological ancient past is very very much part of um, extremist ideology and it's deeply toxic as well because it leads into a, a very problematic areas when it's bound up with politics and with ideas of masculinity and as we've seen sometimes ideas of femininity as well but above all really it's a cultural dead end it leads nowhere and fortunately for us it simply leads to more of the same kind of dead-ended sort of culture but unfortunately these groups do exist and they are at the fringes mostly at the fringes of heathenry and of extremist ideology we see it also in the concept of a wolf of odin you've seen that t-shirt better be a wolf of odin than a sheep of god or something like that it doesn't really mean anything there's no meaning to it it's almost like a thought terminating cliche this concept but it's certainly been appropriated and fed into various militaristic groups some of which are fascistic and very very unpleasant things um, throughout Europe and, uh, and, and, and beyond, unfortunately. And in the research that I've done, I kept coming across very unpleasant sort of groups when I was trying to do legitimate, serious research, whether it was into proto-Indo-European stuff or whether it's into modern incarnations of this. Again and again, I kept coming up, coming up against these very unpleasant, sort of toxic groups. Whether it was on openly white supremacist websites or whether it was people with a strange form of nationalism or pseudo paramilitary groups that sort of thing so it has deeply negative connotations in the public perception regrettably despite the fact i'm interested in wolves and werewolves and i've written about it many many times it is a major issue whenever you begin to talk about wolves and werewolves and that sort of thing because it is again this alluring concept and it is inevitably political in the worst sense because people see themselves as some kind of ravening beast although wolves aren't like that but of course the people making these connections don't actually read or certainly aren't reading any anything useful now there is evidence here and there of the female wolf cult you probably saw the slide before of uh, operation werewolf and there was very briefly a spin-off version of that it was called Operation She-Wolf, although it's all been scrubbed off the web. I have seen a few images of it. And this image behind here, although it's a sort of esoteric, sort of surreal photograph, that was used on one of their websites talking about um, the female wolf cult. And in theory, it could be something very affirming and positive. Unfortunately, it was very hypothetical, really, because it doesn't really exist, or it certainly doesn't really exist in the research that I've done, although I've spoken about it, my own ideas were very speculative, I must admit that. And I've come across other evidence where people have strongly debunked what I've put. So I'm happy to be disabused of that. 
there's the concept of the women who run with wolves. It was this fascinating sort of uh, feminist tract, but again, not really pagan. It was more to do with a sort of an empowerment sort of concept. Nothing bad with that, but not quite heathenry. And as I said, the my speculative idea was that it was linked in with magic, with sorcery and life rights, which is my my hypothesis. But again, it's I couldn't quite pin it down to facts. There's a suggestion of it, and I'm happy to share the talk on that another time. But that is something that I was getting into and thinking, is this possible? Is it something there? But of course, there's another issue with that. I was thinking about something called the Frauenbund. Maybe there was some kind of group of women and stuff like that who were doing a different kind of belief system. But again, highly, highly speculative. And in the few examples I found of actual female wolf cults or whatever you want, some kind of heathen type things, it was extremely passive and very almost getting into what's called the trad wife type territory, despite the aesthetics of being powerful, you know, and uh, very, very empowered. The actual result of those groups that I found was very, very traditional in, the, in both a conservative and a big C and a small C sense. So again, not really where we want to be going and certainly not inclusive because when I began to share this sort of information, I hypothetically sort of was this hypothetical concept of the Frauenbund or the female wolf cult. A number of people said, well, why are you doing it so gendered? Does it have to be so gendered? What about non-binary people? What about trans people? And that, and that had just simply never occurred to me. So then I very much went back to the drawing board. I thought, well, I'm heading in the wrong direction of having this very strongly gendered concept. But I do believe there is something positive there that can come out of this. And that's really the, the meat and bones of this talk. Because I felt there must be something there. And initially I thought, well, perhaps I could get work with uh, another author or another researcher and develop a third way. But even then, that's still that doesn't account for all the sort of multiple identities and you know the full gender spectrum of people, or sometimes I like to call it the full Rubik's Cube of humanity, who would be interested in heathenry. It's still somehow exclusive to some people. And that's not what we want. So as I say, the she-wolf cult, ultimately the ones I found were toxic, not in a different way to some of the male wolf cult stuff, like the, you know, the um, Operation Werewolf and the Wolves of Vinland and those types, but still not very productive and very, very submissive, which again is in that trad wife kind of concept, not what we want, and, and certainly not in Heathbury, where it should be a, a more positive way for all of us. And aside from those horrible toxic groups that I found, regrettably, it was mostly non-existent. And there's no point in building something if it is if there's no appetite for it, particularly if it is submissive and toxic are the few examples I found. So here we start entering into the territory of UPG. I believe there is a, a new way we can bring out the wolf cult or whatever in a positive, benign, constructive way. It's not going to be gendered in any way at all. It should be open to all whoever wants to get involved with that perspective or feel drawn to it, regardless of their identity. should be inclusive, like inclusive heathenry, which is the growth of all these groups we've seen around the world when they throw the, you know, an end to gatekeeping. The, it's, the, it's the opposite of that. The gates open, come on in. That's the way it should be. But above all, it should be heathen, I believe. So it needs to be non-gendered, inclusive, and heathen, but also linked with the wolves and linked with all of that, that passion how can we do that? Well, again, this is into brand new territory for me. Sort of uh, exposing myself in the most benign way to sort of th this new idea. And I'm hoping that after this, as I go further into this, I can get some feedback as to ways to build this as well. 
So we're going to talk about UPG. Now, I know that many of you will have heard that term, but for those of you who haven't heard that term, let's just get that out of the way. Sometimes called unverified personal gnosis. Now, what, that, what does that mean? Well, the short version is that that's, you've had some contact or personal religious revelation in a sense, which is unique to you. It might be nothing in the law, nothing in the text, but you feel moved by something into your practice. But it's not verified, you can't prove it, but that's fine. We all have that in heathenry, whether you would call it that or not. The more benign way of calling it is unique personal gnosis. It's something unique to you and that's fine. And that's also a very positive thing because there are many, many gaps in the law as we all know. And not saying we should all fill them the same way, but local practice and things like that, that is very much the way forward. But if we're very lucky, we can develop something called shared personal analysis. So it is people who have different revelations or different feelings, they meet and talk about it, and people find that actually, well, the idea I had, there's nothing at all, it's the same as your idea, that whole new practices will develop. And that is my hope for the way that we're gonna go forward here. This is very much, me sort of opening the door on, on hopefully a new concept. So first of all, we have the problem of Odin. The problem of Odin? Why would you have a problem with Odin? Well, for many reasons. Now I do like uh, this God and the first sort of uh, interaction I, I've ever felt or, or in a spiritual level was at a, a, a ritual where Odin was invoked. So it's not that I have a personal problem with it, but it is the concept of Odin and many of the attributes linked to him. If one follows that path too much, I believe it is some, it can be a problem because he is the God of ecstasy, but also fury and also madness. And also war, violence, destruction. And this is possibly why people who love those things, are drawn to him, whether they are heathen or not. They have that, it has that allure. But I believe that following that path ultimately leads to self-destruction too far. So how do we counter that while also not denying those things that are present within all of us? Because the allure of Odin is an enduring problem, but also a blessing at the same time. Excuse my Christian imagery there, but that's what I'm getting at. It can be toxic, but also intoxicating. Very much in the same way that people who like to drink alcohol is great, but too much of it, and you have a problem. And too much of it over a very long time is a very big problem. And uh, the concept of victory is very much, and, and, and triumph is very much part of Odinic sort of concepts. But there was a, a fiction book I read where there's this fantastic thing where somebody says, praying to Odin for victory is fantastic, but it doesn't always mean your victory. And that was a very interesting idea that the victory might not be what you want. It might be something terrible for you, but great for someone else. So who's victory? But then the other side of that, do we want to really put Odin in chains and bind all that power and knowledge and fearsome sort of energy? Suppression of desire or suppression of will? That's not very heathen, but equally, there must be a way to temper this power, this energy of Odin. Is there possibly a way to channel this emotion in a benign way that can be constructive without being destructive? As we saw earlier, all of those groups who have pursued that endlessly have ended up in very toxic, unpleasant places. 
But we can't cast Odin aside. He is the old father after all. There must be some method of balance. So I believe that we will find out with Europe. Now this is very much my own UPG, based on a number of personal experiences I had. Yod is often called the earth, or there's various other derivations in linguistic things, which I won't get into, but Yorth or Earth, and even in multiple old dialects, you will find the word earth is pronounced Earth. And even in Northumbrian, which isn't that really that, that old a dialect, but I've seen it written Earth, E-O. And you see that in uh, various other Scandinavian and older sort of phrases as well. She's Odin's lover and wife, and the mother of Thor, of course, protector of Midgard. So certainly benign in that sense, because Thor being this protector god, and she's his mother, then that again is a solid grounding effect. And I believe that this is the beginnings of what could be a temperance to the ecstasy of Odin. Now, she's sometimes identified as Mother Earth, or Gaia and that sort of concept. But really that's a, that's, a, that's a more modern sort of approach or identification of her. But certainly in the few people I do know who have had interactions with her or have um, worshipped her or worship her, they describe her as being nurturing, potentially passive, certainly in the few skaldic sources we have, they're not ex exactly flattering. But again, those Scalic sources are from much, much later. But I believe that this is a beginnings of, of, a, of a god, goddess to worship in parallel with Odin, if we are going to follow this wolf or that sort of path. Because it will link into things such as ecology, sorely lacking in a lot of modern heathen beliefs will be a part of a decent heathen response or interaction, a route for that, rather than being the quote unquote more fluffy sort of Mother Earth, Gaia sort of approach, but a, a, a strong, powerful concept. Channel for this passion. And also feed into concepts such as animism. It is to do with a concept called rediscovery, which uh, I heard on a podcast I recorded, and it was an idea that I absolutely loved and it never occurred to me, was that we are not really adding things to gods. We are simply rediscovering aspects of those gods and rediscovering aspects of yours, who has pretty much a lack of worship bar one or two, very few people I know actually worship or have altars to your. Certainly inclusive, we all live on the earth. We all interact with it on a daily basis. And it is certainly part of our grounding procedures and certain practices we do. And because of, but this can be a positive thing because there are very few preconceptions about your. When people think of Odin or Thor or Freya or whoever, they have preconceptions about what those gods are or what they look like. But you're, the, the sources are so sparse, there is huge scope for her to be very much reinvigorated and become part of regular heathen practice, regular heathen worship. And so, we're getting into this, my own personal revelations here. Because I took part in an event in September last year uh, called Grimniasmut, where we raised this nine, ten foot um, god post to Odin. Fantastic ritual, absolutely enjoyed it. And we had a, a nine hour pre ritual preparation of the god post where people chanted or said things <coughs> over the god post in preparation for the main ritual. 
and I'm not somebody who's very prone to getting the God phone to ring or anything. Although I am a heathen, I don't have very many esoteric experiences. That doesn't bother me. It doesn't upset me. It's just, you know, my way and that's fine. But while I was taking part in this pre-ritual event <clears throat> uh, for Grimnir's Moot and chanting the names of Odin over the God post in a sort of separate sort of ritual area, every time we went through the list and one of the lines was the, the lover of Yurt, that name and that phrase echoed again and again in my head as... And I kept visualizing this giantess, this vast, vast woman sleeping beneath the earth. And I'd never heard that concept before. Now, I assumed I'd seen it somewhere or read it somewhere. But in preparing for this talk, I could find no images anywhere of a woman sleeping under the earth. This image you can see behind is the closest I could find. And I asked people who are more spiritually and mystically inclined what they thought and their response was oh that's interesting i've never heard of that so i filed that away and think, well that's interesting i'll come back to that and the most recent event was at freya's blood where we raised another nine ten foot god post to freya a fantastic event and as the closing ritual for the whole weekend was going forward. One person who had a, an idol, a small a sort of a god post to Yort, said, hey, Yort, and thanked them for participating in the ritual. Again, again, there was that, that word was echoing within me. Not a god or goddess I'd ever considered or, or done any reading about. And suddenly it was, I felt, Yod, Yod, why Yod? And then it occurred to me that this is the way to have a grounding effect on that ecstasy of Odin. Rather than trying to do it oneself, if one invoked a goddess with as much immensity and power, in my opinion, as Odin, and a consort of Odin, then that would be the way forward. To me, it was the final piece of the puzzle. I've been trying to find a way to worship the Odin, this, this sort of wolf practice in a way that was benign and non-toxic, but also to channel all that energy and devotion that people felt drawn to it. So in conclusion, my idea is to have something called the narrow way which will be a ritual, a guided meditation, if you will, invoking both God and goddess, neither passive nor destructive, neither aggressive, holy, or submissive completely. To be able to have that balance between the aggressive, unbridled ecstasy and destruction of Odin, with the cool, calm passivity, perhaps, of Yord. But of course, Yord is not entirely passive either. If you've ever seen a volcano or an earthquake or the thunder and lightning or the shaking of the earth, then that isn't entirely passive either. And that, to me, will be the way forward to bring uh, an idea of a positive, benign, way of a wolf cult into heathenry in a way that will not end up in a toxic mess, but neither will be completely passive or completely dead, for want of a better phrase. There'll be a new ritual, which I hope to trial at various events coming forward. And I welcome anybody who would participate in that. It'll be a new wolf cult for inclusive heathenry. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Rich. That's a very interesting food for thought there. A lot of food for thought. So uh, do we have questions, comments from people for Rich on, on any aspect of what he's talking about? If you've heard him talk before, you may well have heard some of the uh, his prior research and things. Uh, but I'm sure he'd be happy to answer any questions Absolutely. on some of those things that he didn't cover today. Happy to be told I'm wrong as well. I, I, I struggle with some of the words. I've seen somebody's made a comment there about passive. Yes, I, I'm not happy about that. I need to find a, a better word than that. Yes, and as Jen says, wolf alpha is a result of poor research. But that, that meme refuses to die. The wolf alphas, the alpha wolf, was actually debunked by the man who came up with it. Um, indeed. Oh, there's a lot of comments in the in the chat. Should I scroll back or would you want to tell me what uh, those are, Pauline? There weren't any specific questions, just some general bits and pieces of comments. I think mm -hmm. as different people were reacting to different things that you were saying. Um, some were comments on their own interactions with Odin and different facets of them from their research and experiences. Um, well, somebody's raised a hand. Karina. How do you feel about the concept, and I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation, but of the Philgia? And because uh, I know that a lot of people like to kind of pick their own Philgia, and I don't think that's really supposed to be how it works. Um, I've always been obsessed with the wolves since early childhood. And when I used to run uh, long distance, I would always visualize a wolf and I've had lots and lots of dreams of being a wolf. And I feel like I'm in a wolf's body when I'm in, during these dreams, but I'm probably, you know, like my, if, if I have a philgia, it could very well be, you know, a mouse or something. And I'm just curious, it's a little off topic, but I'm wondering what your thoughts on, on, on wolves as, as a philgia and, and do you think people kind of massage the direction of what they think their philgia is supposed to be? I think you could still pursue this path regardless of what your filia is, because I think this is not about a totemic approach to wolves. You must have a wolf inside you to, to pursue. No, I want to get away from that. You know, you should be able to see them as a, as a sort of a focus. We obviously old in house wolves and various other gods and goddesses are linked to wolves. Um, even sort of in, in, in Greek, there are sort of uh, a lot of women linked to wolves in, in, in Greek mythology. So I don't think it's about that pursuit. Although, interestingly, I found this out just the other day, so it was too late to include in my talk. I know that um, Winifred Rose Hodge has written about um, Hoogskreft and about ways of channeling stuff, which is way beyond my sort of, uh, sort of skill to talk about, because he's uh, written an amazing work. So I literally read that about two days ago. So if I'd had time, but the talk might have been another hour longer, but uh, that, that was, uh, but there has, uh, I think, Hoogskreft, I think is what she called it. So I think that might be something down the area you're, you're talking about. I'm disappointed nobody's telling me I'm wrong. I'm, it means I'm completely right. Heathens aren't telling me I'm wrong. Surely, surely there must be somebody. What I will say is, I'm in. I'm curious. I mean, obviously, you've had some strong visual uh, connections with Yod, but have you looked into Frigg as a balancing energy? There, I, 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 mean, I did. A very I, obvious partnership. I know, uh, and that was another. That was that was the surprising thing to me because I'd never considered Yod or never. I've never offered anything to Yod. Never worshipped her or done anything for that. But this this is going to change. Um, but uh, again, I was thinking, well, what what do we know of you know? Because I I, my, I thought, well, maybe there's a book, and I've, I've, I'm struggling to find very many sources on her. Um, although I've just recently uh, found out about the Scaldic poetry, so I'm, I'm, I, I've ordered that to sort of delve into that. Um, I think we are going to have to build new practices, and that's going to arise from the heathen community, from shared personal gnosis. It's going to arise from that. Um, Again, this is UPG. This is this is my own sort of feeling, and most of the gods I've offered to have been male. Never done any sort of you know. Uh, the other god I I, I honor is is Hunir. I only picked him because 
nobody ever offers to Hunia. So I thought, well, he he needs some love. For the, plus, he's indecisive, and I'm often indecisive, but he's also a survivor, so I like that as well. So, um, so yes, I, I need to do more research. Maybe maybe next year I'll come back with a big a big talk on Yorth. The big woman under the earth. Fantastic. Oh, who's next? Thursday. Sorry. Thursday's got her hand up. Oh, Thursday. Hello. Hi. Um, you know, like with when you work with Odin and you're talking about wolves, I, mm. I see wolves as a, a symbol of strength. When you have uh because Odin is many things as we know, but he is also a teacher as well. And he and he's um you know he's he's been kind of there for me when I was going through a bit of a dodgy patch in my head, mm. so to speak. But anyway, I always find that wolves, you know, you could be a lone wolf, but then you can come back with the pack, which means that you could be stronger and keeping a balance, which I agree with Pauline is you have a balance with Frigg. And that's why I have Frigg and I have Odin. It keeps a good balance in between. So it's like Mother Earth, you know, you keep a balance. So you're perfectly balanced there. So, and not only that, for me, for Odin is the wanderer. And mm. I have wandering spirit. I have, you know, I'm, I'm never still. I'm always doing something. And um, my family are, well, some of my family are from Romany Gypsies and mm. travellers. So they are also outsiders because they are never an accepted community. So Odin for me works for, in all those aspects for me. I Absolutely. I, I fundamentally agree with what you're saying about being <clears throat> the concept of the outsider. And the yeah. number of times I've been at large heathen gatherings and it ends up being a bunch of people kind of stood away from the fire, kind of just hanging out, even though it's colder there. And I often, and it occurred to me when I was doing that, the most recent sort of event, everyone else having a great time, the people still enjoying themselves, but wanting to pull away and do something a bit more quiet or a bit more introspective. Mm. And I thought, oh, wouldn't it be great if I could have another ritual just over there and just do a a more introspective thing to, for the outsiders, for the people drawn away from the fire a little bit. And I think that is the territory I'm hoping to explore more. Mm. I'm quite happy anyway. My uh, strongest experiences with ritual have been outside of the normal group. So going to like an alchemical fire and mm. some small portion of us spun off into our own circle on the side and we're doing chanting or singing along with the drumming that was happening and it just uh ends up being uh sort of a piggybacking to that larger um mm. energy that's being raised but also like um a, a more uh focused sort of thing and a bit more intense as well um i also wanted to say like how you should be an audio narrator or something. Like your voice is so beautiful. Do you have a podcast or? Uh, I've, uh, well, um, Suzanne, <laughs> do I have a podcast? <laughs> There's uh, the weird thing I I, I, I record. Yes. <laughs> I record with pod uh, with, with Suzanne and a number of other people. It's all about inclusive heathenry. So I'm the token straight white man on that. Uh, which is, but uh, we do this uh, very interesting podcast about inclusivity and season two is coming soon. We've had some very interesting conversations on, on that. Um, but if you really want to hear, hear my voice, so uh, if I lean close to the mic, if you like a bit of ASMR, I can talk about wolves like that. <laughs> <laughs> there, there we go. A, there was a question in the chat. Uh, yes. About, uh, no, wait, what was it? Uh, the, the, Yes, uh, Anna asks, uh, your perception of Fenrir and what are your thoughts that uh, everyone can have their own Fenrir inside? Well, yes, I think we all have the capacity for destruction within us. And that is very much what I was trying to temper with this new approach. It's not about denying that, but sort of saying, acknowledging it, that's, that can be a problem, but I'm not, but as long as I'm aware of it, it's not going to cause me a problem if you're aware of that. We might talk about strategies or be, being aware of the, this sort of potential for destruction. 
I know other people have a completely different uh, view of Fenrir. They honour Fenrir and see Fenrir as misunderstood, and they have their own personal practice for that. There's other heathens who get very, very cross about that, but less said about them, the better. Oh, there's 72 comments in the chat. Have I, have I missed anything good? There's, there's so many questions. Mixture of comments, um, discussion... Trying to see if any any. Oh, else. Somebody mentioned the title of a book. I don't know what that was. Was that the Women Who Run with Wolves, which is uh, a very interesting book, but not quite in my sort of uh, wheelhouse, as it were. I'm sure, somebody can find find that and Google that. But uh, yeah, I mean, when you start researching into wolves and wolf cults. Uh, it is a deep rabbit hole, a deep wolf hole, if you might say, because there's so many books on, and, and so many terrible books on wolves as well. Uh, but I'm happy to share a bibliography, or we can append that to whatever package we put out. Um, but there, you know, the, the concept of wolves, and you can see it in multiple cultures going very, very far back in time. And that's really, I, I wonder why I'm being drawn to Yord, because a very ancient goddess, this very sort of potentially linked into sort of um, I don't say land rights and, and, and that sort of thing, but that sort of deep time sort of concept. Oh, Larissa's got a hand up. Hi, I just caught the tail end of this, but you mentioned a book, something about Hookcraft, or I couldn't hear the title. Oh, it's, you mentioned. it's not a book. It's, a, it's, a, it's an article online um, oh, okay. by uh, Winifred Rose Hodge, who's written okay. book. Or I think she's a member of the Troth and has written all kinds of interesting stuff. It was recommended to me by Count Heath, who, of course, you probably know from her book, books, I should say. And she mentioned there's this very, very in-depth concept of, of, of Filgur and, and the concept of uh, how that can be channeled. Uh, not quite the same as what I was talking about, but um, if I'd had time to properly delve into it and the sort of the concept of Wood and things like that, uh, I think that may be something I fold into with full credit given to Winifred uh, if, I, if I do f further talks on this subject. Okay, that would be really interesting because I've read a lot of Winifred's books as well and articles. I think, I think it's Hugskreft, H-U-G-S-K-R-E-F-T, I think, I think if I remember rightly. Okay, thank you very much. That's what I was trying to get sure. at. <laughs> yeah, that's great, yeah. I, you know, there's a lot of stuff about wolves that I've come across in my own research. I'm mm. writing a book on... Um, the hell and the morgan mm. so uh, i've run into a few passages which also link wolves to hell as well and especially since one of her guardians is like this big giant mm. almost demonic type dog wolf thing but uh it's kind of interesting like how wolves just keep showing up throughout um well the more you research them the more they tend to show up uh, i don't know whether you're <laughs> familiar with the work of kim mccone at all no I should look at uh, Kim McCohn wrote this book about uh, wolves and how they were linking to the sort of the, the Fianna and things like that. If you can't find the article, send me a message or somebody will, uh, you know, I, I, I've probably got it for you. I don't know how it'll tie in with uh, the Morrigan or anything like that, but it's certainly it's a very serious uh, piece of research that he's done. Oh, that might be helpful. All right. Thank you. Sure. Um, Kirsten's put a question into the chat for you, Rich. Mm -hmm. Yes. As you mentioned ancient or Iron Age wolf ritual. Yes. Any recommendations or places you suggest to look for this? Uh, if you simply search for, um, I think it's called Wolf Rites of Winter, uh, uh, there's various sort of clickbait articles floating around about that, but the actual original paper is by David Anthony and Dorcas Brown. And that's where it's the main piece of research is from. Uh, I think David Anthony has done a book called The Horse, the Wheel and Language, which is sort of delving into all of that, which is really interesting. But if you, you know, if you, you'll come across various sort of um, mythology.net or ancienthistory.net, but they're all based on this particular paper by them. I think there's even a YouTube lecture by Douglas Brown, David Anthony, uh, which where they talk through it. But essentially the, the, this is part of my previous talks, um, is this idea that they found this huge grave of dogs and wolves, uh, clearly done over a very, very long period of time, clearly being killed in some ritualistic way and seemed to be linked in with some kind of adolescent 
sort of uh, uh, sort of sort of uh, ritualized gang warfare, the people who live outside the village and that sort of thing. So this that was their speculation based upon that. Thanks. And um, I'm sure if, um, if you want to find Rich on Facebook and oh, yes. him for further references and questions, he'll be delighted to help out. I have <laughs> many, many PDFs and things to share. As, as, uh, I'm always terrified I'm going to find something and never find the article. So if I can extract the PDF or get, get the documentation and save it down somewhere, then I, I always will. Um, and you might want to look into some of the Celtic end of things for Sleeping Goddess end of things. For example, Kalanish. All right. Um, uh, the landscape of Kalanish is sometimes referred to as the sleeping goddess. Interesting. Interesting. In certain angles you see, particularly the, as the full moon in the winter rolls over the hills, it's a shape of a goddess. There's a few similar things like that. Um, and there's an ancient, what's probably goddess figure in Malta, ancient underground temple. I think she's referred right. to as a sleeping goddess as well. You see, this is this is great, but also frustrating because when I searched, I thought sleeping goddess or anything like that, I got nothing. The, the research, the, the image, the search that came back were, were, were useless. So I thought, <laughs> I, where did this idea come from? I thought, well, there must have been an image somewhere or something that was been discussed, but I found very, very few sort of depictions. So that, that's really helpful. Um, I've just seen some more stuff in the chat there. Just a second. Um, oh, goodness me, this is so many messages. Um, Moon and Roman Three Wheels is a book of a Jungian analyst. Uh, yes, yes, uh, that's the book. Yes, it, it, it's not. A, it is a very interesting book, but I was hoping it was all going to be about uh, European stuff. But it is more to do with a feminist sort of concept in 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 Mexican sort of folklore as well. Another book I would recommend, although I don't quite buy the theories, by Chris Kershaw. It's horribly, horribly expensive, but it's called um, The One-Eyed God by Chris Kershaw. That's with two K on each name, Chris Kershaw. And it talks about this concept of, was there a continuous Odinic wolf cult from Bronze Age to the sort of um, last gasp of the Heathen Age? I suspect not. However, the reason I'd recommend it is the ridiculous amount of research and links and sort of uh, textual references and references within it are an absolute goldmine and sort of tre treasure trove of links to sort of jump off into other areas of research. So I'd strongly recommend that one, although it is horribly expensive. Karina, have you got another question? Yes. Uh two things I was just thinking of, if anybody's interested, I, I found it very disturbing, to be honest, but when you mentioned these mounds where they found wolf and, and dog mm. bodies, I'm not sure if it's related, but there was a, a documentary a while ago, and I can find it pretty easily if anybody's curious um, about boys in some, I think like in Belgium, I think they were Flemish, uh, mm. that went through coming of age things where they raised a, a large puppy like like a like a working line kind of dog for that age and then they would go out when they were doing their manhood thing and and they they after raising and training the puppy they would kill it i mean honestly it was pretty disturbing but i'm just what sort of era was that maybe that might be what you're talking about I, it was earlier than viking age i'm going to say okay. it was like bronze age or something I'll see if I can find it and I, and I can try to send it to you. Um, it should be pretty easy. And then the other thing I was thinking about, about uh, and I think that you'll probably agree, and I think that the young lady here who's a dog trainer will also agree. It's funny how there are so many macho people or people that are just seeking empowerment, I suppose, that look at wolves as being you know, this monstrous thing mm. when they, the alpha and all that other nonsense. I got to tell you, like from really, really early childhood, super early childhood, the thing that turned me on about wolves was the family structure and their social structure. And I've Absolutely, never yes. viewed them as something scary and horrible. They, And I think as heathens, I think like when we think about inner guard and, and or, or inner yard and, and, and outer yard, I think that wolves in a lot of ways are very representative of that like like that's kind of like it's like an it's like the 
nature version or the animal version of what we kind of seek for ourselves with our kin. But anyway, that's all I got to say. And then, and, and, and the whole alpha thing really isn't really an alpha thing. It's just the two eldest wolves. It's the ones that made the pack. The ones it's, that it's get usually the, the parents because they've usually. been there the longest. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, and, and you've been awesome. Thank you. Uh, yes, I think uh, that there are these horrific sort of rights and stuff. But the interesting thing is when you start delving into wolf cults or, or anything with the wolf relict in some kind of religious aspect, you'll find that in, I think there was in the sort of early Middle Ages in sort of well, what was then Persia, there were these fearsome warriors who are described as the two-footed wolves. And there's various other sort of symbolic represent. always seem to be a pro, uh, associated with martial or aggressive uh, generally sort of uh, sort of i won't say bad culture but certainly um certainly nothing benign whereas it's only in the much much older concepts that you find something a bit more w positive is what i'll say uh, shay you've got your hand up last question uh yeah i wanted to piggyback on what karina was saying um it reminds me of um had a friend whose child was a young teenager was starting to wear a wolf wolf ears and wolf tail to school and it was a fad that was going around throughout their their friends and and through like uh cosplay events and anime mm -hmm. conventions and such and it it was a uh, um the the parents said that she thought it was wonderful because they had found a community and anybody who saw someone with a tail or instantly knew that that person was the pack and that they were in in this thing together and that they could recognize each other and and I, I think I agree so much that like what draws me to wolves is the whole pack mentality of like having this group of of uh, like a community a small insular community that is um, working together in various ways well, there is a heathen, I know what I put, uh, their stuff is private. I, I haven't read it, but I know they're working on something they described as heathen pack magic. Uh, so, but unfortunately, because it is private stuff, I've only sort of, they've, they've talked about it obliquely, but they haven't really delved too much into it. But I'm hoping they'll eventually write a book or put something out about that, because that's something I'd really, really like to read about. Well, that seems a really good place to finish up. Thank you very much for joining us, joining us again, Rich. Always a pleasure. Um, and I hope that everyone's enjoyed the day and that you'll all come back tomorrow for yet more fabulous speakers. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what sort of wonderful insights we'll all pick up and gain tomorrow. But thank you again, Rich. You're welcome. And that being said, I will say good night and we'll close things down. That's good night here. I know in America it's good afternoon, but it's much later here. So cheers from Scotland.